Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I begin today by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather. <coughs> the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to Elders past and present. I also acknowledge the Darug people as the custodians of the lands and waters surrounding Penrith. <clears throat> it is an absolute honour to stand here addressing you as the member for Penrith. I am both ecstatic and humbled by this privilege that the people of Penrith have entrusted to me. Penrith, I will not let you down. No. Yeah. I also acknowledge previous members in our area who have worked for the city, especially those Labor members who have personally provided me with friendship and support over many years. The late Ron Mulock AO, Peter Anderson AM, Faye Lopo AM, the late Jim Anderson, Diane Beamer, and of course, Prukar. I'm quite blown away by the crowd that have come today. Whenever I was asked about when my inaugural would be, I would respond with, I'm not that interesting. <laughs> <laughs> then someone pointed out that this is my opportunity to capture my story. Yeah. So far, we've heard some amazing stories in this place, and I'm constantly reminded that everyone has a story. You just need to be prepared to listen. I was born not five kilometres from this place on Gadigal land at the South Sydney Women's Hospital, a place I had not heard much about, and in writing this I discovered that it was a maternity hospital particularly for poor and unmarried women. It previously had the inauspicious name of the Home of Hope for Friendless and Fallen Women. How ironic. <laughs> I believe soon after my birth, my parents moved from inner city to the outback town of Darnick, which was on the Ivanhoe to Menindee Road, roughly 880 kilometres from Sydney. Again, from what I ascertain, the move was for my father to work, and he landed on a sheep station, dagging or crutching sheep. So, you have an inner city boy working on a sheep station in the middle of what he thought nowhere, newly married with a small baby. What could possibly go wrong, you ask? <laughs> Within a matter of months, we had returned to inner Sydney <laughs> to live with my paternal grandmother, and my mother left us soon after, and the marriage was over. My nana was at this time nearing 70. I understand I was around eight, uh, 14 months old. My nana was an amazingly independent woman. She lived in a rented terrace, a two-up, two-down house, with an outhouse toilet. This was extremely challenging given she had very limited mobility due to a previous accident which had left her with one leg significantly shorter than the other and she wore a built-up shoe. She couldn't walk around without holding on to the furniture. She rarely left the house and managed to survive on a widow's pension. My father never really recovered from my mother deserting him, as it was then termed, with a small baby. My father had his own demons. He became an alcoholic and certainly had mental health issues. I remember him disappearing for periods of time where he would be away in Broughton House, Callum Park for treatment. I clearly, I clearly remember having to lay low at the same time so that child welfare were not notified and I would not be removed from my nan and placed into care. While there was not much money around growing up, I lived in what could only be best termed a colourful neighbourhood. <laughs> I'm sure the authorities called it notorious. We had all the entertainment right there on the street where I lived. We had cricket stumps painted on the walls either side of the road, a corner shop, an SP bookie at the top of the street, a sly grog shop at the bottom of the street, and weekly two-up games on Saturday afternoon in our back lane. For us local kids, this was not a bad thing, as we earned our pocket money by standing lookout at the lane entrances during two-up. We were termed cockatoos. We would then go off ice skating at Prince Alfred Park, or a Newtown footy game at Henson Park, or Emmore pitches, or swimming pool, depending on the season. However, one of my favourite pastimes was to sit and listen to my nan's stories. 
I would often plead with her to tell me about the olden days. The only taboo subject was my mother, so I quickly learned not to ask. I'd constantly question Nan about her early life. She described her time seeing her first talking picture and rushed home to tell her ma, who thought she'd gone mad. <laughs> she told me about her fiance who never made it home from the First World War and the hardships during the Depression. When I asked about my grandfather, she said very little. From what I gleaned, her marriage was very violent. She explained that my grandfather had returned from the Second World War a different man, quite unrecognisable, and she had to throw him out. Now I wish I had the foresight at the time to write her stories down. I recall the day the story stopped. It was when I asked Nan what a John the Baptist looked like. We were a team, Nan and I. <laughs> Anyone who has lived in the chaos of a family with addictions will understand. In hindsight, I came to realise that my mother leaving was a blessing in disguise. My grandmother was a formidable, independent woman with a strong sense of social justice, a wicked sense of humour. I couldn't have asked for a better role model and she certainly shaped the woman and strong feminist I am today. As a child, I remember it coming time to vote and asking Nan what she was doing. Voting, she said. I asked, who do we vote for, Nan? I can still hear her words today. Love, we're workers. We'll always be workers and we'll always vote Labor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Only Labor looks after the workers. Yeah. I've never forgotten it. I bleed Labor. Unfortunately, finishing high school was not an option for me. It was always my biggest regret. Not that I was particularly studious. For me, it was the, se the social interaction. <laughs> By the time I turned 15, I had to go out and work to contribute to the house. Again, another great life lesson came from my nan as I headed out the door. First thing you do, Karen, is you join your union. Yes, nan, I said, and I've remained a member ever since. Due to her declining health, my nan had to go into aged care. I was then 17, pregnant, and told you don't bring your problems home. So I'm out on my own, but with the support of a lifelong friend, Cher, who has now passed, I, amazing, I amazingly make it as a single mum. On the upside, for the first time, I finally had an inside loo. <laughs> Fast forward a few years, and a work colleague was trying to set me up on a blind date. It was then I had the most fortunate day of my life, and I met my husband, Brendan, at the Auburn Soccer Club. <laughs> Our first date was memorable. When I came out to meet him, the car engine was running. And as he later confessed, he couldn't recall what I looked like and he was prepared for a quick exit. <laughs> for me, my reluctance was the fact that he drove a panel van. <laughs> we went for a Chinese meal in Parramatta. We, had, we went to the Roxy for a movie, and 17 months later, after meeting, we married. We, came, we became an instant family. Brendan, I love you immeasurably. I know I don't tell you enough. Well, now, it's on the public record. <laughs> <laughs> Brendan had emigrated from Northern Ireland 10 years before, and has always joked that he never thought about settling down until we met as I was the first woman who had met his three criteria. For me, it was as superficial as he had long blonde hair and an Irish accent. <laughs> so what were the three criteria? One, I voted Labor. Two, I was Catholic. Three, I barracked for Western Sydney magpies. <laughs> I haven't been game enough to ask if they were ranked. Now, I need to digress here. And state for the record, I'm a Mad Panthers supporter. <laughs> for the longest time, my family wouldn't let me support the, Ma uh, the Panthers. As they said, I was a jinx, because every team I barracked for disappeared. <laughs> I grew up supporting Newtown Jets. They go. They go. 
I then moved out to Lidcombe and was supporting the magpies and they merged with the tigers. Not the same. Sorry, Pete. <laughs> I thought I should support our team, our local team, but my family pleaded with me, Mum, no. Why don't you go for the manly sea eagles? <laughs> <laughs> or the broncos? <laughs> Brendan has always been my rock, my biggest supporter and cheerleader. If I ever introduced him as my partner, he would retort, yes, and she's my first wife. <laughs> well, first wife of almost 42 amazing years and counting. When I expressed a wish to go back and study as a mature student, it was Brendan who encouraged me. I was able to do a bridging course thanks to TAFE and eventually a commerce degree at Western Sydney University while working night shift in the finance industry and having four kids. I am one of those statistics of which, of which WSU is so proud, the first in my family to go to university. Thanks, Goff. We purchased our first home in Lidcombe, thanks to a Hawke government. It was a two bedroom weatherboard. We had a first mortgage, a second mortgage, and a personal loan to make up the balance of the deposit. The week we settled, we had four kids, the sum total of $20 in the bank. It's become a bit of a standing joke in our house that when we talk about how I packed Brendan's lunch but only had one slice of ham left, so I cut it horizontal and deftly stretched it across two sandwiches. <laughs> All was good until he went to add the salt and took them apart in the lunchroom with his colleagues. <laughs> However, we were on top of the world. We both had jobs, we had our health, and of course, Labor <coughs> state and federal governments. There's never a truer quote than good government can change lives. We quickly outgrew our Lidcombe house and purchased in Lee and a suburb of Penrith. Brendan was a keen golfer and had played the Lee and a course and loved it. I said I'd give it five years. So here we are 35 years later and I wouldn't live anywhere else. We quickly put down deep roots in our community and even owned our, and operated our own small local business. When I say we, it's the royal we, as my involvement was the name on the mortgage. <laughs> While I grew up without siblings or an extended family, I have been blessed with the differing families of friends and colleagues that have come into my life along the way. Not one of us here in this place could do this without the love and support of a lot of people. To all who have contributed to and supported me in this journey, I thank you. I need to acknowledge my extensive union family, from FSU, UWU, PSA, when in those first days where I was a delegate representing my colleagues in my workplace to organiser and industrial officer. I have met and worked with the most dedicated unionists who genuinely care about workers. It always disgusts me when I hear the demonisation of unionists. Unionists are people, our mums and dads, brothers and sisters and friends. They're the strangers who risk their own lives and turn up to the accidents on our roads or in our homes. They stock our shelves, engineer our roads and bridges, educate our children, answer our calls for help, pick up our waste, keep our lights on and transport us and our goods. We should never, ever take them for granted. Yeah. I'm eternally grateful that Lynn and Jeff took that chance on me and gave me the opportunity to work in this great movement. I've made, I've made lifelong friendships, Megan and Grant, Nitza and Max, Lynn and John, Rose and Matt. To this day, we still catch up regularly for our Bolshe lunches. Sharon Bailey and Anna Claude, I know you're only a phone call away. This has been an amazing journey and what a journey it's been. Certainly more your marathon than a sprint. You see, it was more than 20 years ago I stood for pre-selection for the Penrith seat. But it was not meant to be. And instead, I took a detour through local government. And as I'm fond of saying, everything happens for a reason. To my local government family, I acknowledge the dedicated councillors who strive every day to deliver for their communities. They do this with next to no recompense, but the intrinsic value of service to community. I especially salute all my fellow Labor councillors. I acknowledge the volunteer women of the Australian Local Government Women's Association who've worked for deco decades to advance women's representation in local government so that we resemble those communities we represent. When I was first elected, there were only 27% female councillors. We're now at 40%. 
We're not yet there, but the gap is narrowing. Again, lifelong friendships have been formed and across the political divide. Many I met during my first term on council, Daria Turley and Daryl Turley, who has travelled here today from Broken Hill. Mate, I hope you got your golf clubs in. <laughs> to Julie Griffiths, who is now literally the other side of my brain. Bev Spearpoint, Kath Presty, Jackie Greenow, to my current colleagues, councillors, John Thane, Robin Cook, Todd Carney, Ross Fowler and Trish Hitchin, our city is in good hands. To all those past councillors, especially Pat Shee, Kayleen Allison, Aaron Duke, David Bradbury and Greg Davies, thank you for your support and service. While I was first elected to council, someone told me beware, they come and take out your kitchen. My family believed that actually happened. <laughs> I'm now worried the parliament may turn up to remove something, and at this point I feel like it's my bed. <laughs> when, when entering local government land, while I felt it was like coming home, it took me a good year to learn the language, and they certainly all spro spoke in acronyms. Our Penrith Council staff were immensely patient and helpful, especially Ruth Goldsmith, Louise Pichel and Jenny Pollard. Jenny Pollard. Our staff are truly amazing. I've had the pleasure of establishing the Multicultural Working Party Resilience Committee and Sustainability Champion for Penrith. Without the support of the staff, this would never have eventuated. We cannot underestimate the value that local government contributes, not just to the community, but also to the political process. President of Local Government New South Wales, Daria Turley, has reminded us recently that 50 of the 135 current New South Wales parliamentarians have once been councillors, and this was a tribute to the community spirit of the MPs concerned and recognition of the fine political training ground local government provides. We shouldn't forget what strong partners they can be. Indeed, I've had the good fortune to participate on many different committees and boards with many of the current sitting members. To those that campaigned in the 2019 election but fell short, my Labor sisters, Mary Ann, Sally and Charisma, I was excited by your success this time round as I was my own. <laughs> Same goes for Kylie Wilkinson and Donna Davis, the member for Penrith, who I've known many years, all fabulous Labor women. To Nathan Hegarty, Judith Hannan, Michael Regan, who have had the pleasure of working with through local government, you pulled off the unthinkable, well done. I need to especially acknowledge Helen Westwood, who I also met in my first term on council, another strong, strongly principled, in integrity-ridden Labor feminist. She was Mayor of Bankstown at the time. I thank you, Helen, for your friendship, your leadership, and giving me the opportunity to work with you when you were elected to the other place. <laughs> Those eight years working in the Legislative Council were invaluable. It was with immense pride when I was twice elected Mayor and Deputy Mayor of Penrith City. My two mayoral terms were only for a short years apart, but vastly different in experiences. During 2021, half our LGA was put into hard lockdown, while the other half were not. It was an exceedingly difficult time for our community, as anger and confusion was rife. It was impossible to explain how this was not political. Mm. I worked with many of the Western and South Western Sydney mayors to fight these inequities. Madam Deputy Speaker, I think I'm going to need an extension. Member six, an extension of time. Is it granted? Yes. yes. Thank you. To my Labor family, my Emu Plains branch members and all our local members who have supported me through five council elections and two state campaigns, a simple thank you is not enough. Young Labor Flying Squad and especially Western Sydney Young Labor, thank you. It's impossible to list all our Red Army. Many of you are here today. My good friends, Lorraine Fordham, Robin and Pete Cook, Julian Phil Plimmer, Michael Reeves, the campaign dynamos of Liam Rankin, George Simon, Dom Offner, Bob Nanver, Mark Moray, Todd Pinkerton, Emma Hogan, Joel, Paul Mills, Jam Cal. Got it in there. <laughs> Sam Tabiri, Julian Gonzalez, Rob Horn. Linda Everingham, Brent Hogan, Rochelle Morwood, Sarah Yilmaz, Nicole Duffy, Pauline Goimer, and all those I have not named. 
Many volunteers are not party members but believed in our agenda, like Jeff Zeba. To the fabulous women of Emily's List, I thank you. To those who hung in there after a gruelling 2019 campaign, when we came all so close. To those who immediately started pressing me to stand again, you know who you are, Tony Gannon. <laughs> thank you. All those committed volunteers from the Nurses and Midwives Association, Fiona, Chris, Georgia, the teachers, community workers and union members, AMWU, RTBU, ASU, Professionals Australia, ETU, PSA, USU, who turned out in their thousands to support a fresh start. You're all awesome. That goes for all the many members in this place and the other place who came out in support over two state campaigns and many, many months, door knocking, stations, street stalls and pre-poll. I'm also passionate about superannuation. So I acknowledge my super family at Active. I can almost hear an audible groan whenever I mention super. It's a source of eternal frustration for me that women retire with so much less than their male colleagues and certainly don't engage enough on the subject. I acknowledge the patience and wisdom of Craig Peat, Gordon Brock, Declan Clausen, Nathan Hegarty and Greg McLean, also dedicated to the members. I believe the true power of Penrith is in its people, its ideas, innovation, its collaboration, its commitment. It has a country town heart with a vibrant city vision. While we have come far, there's still much more to be done to connect our many suburbs covering 75 square kilometres, working with all levels of government to um, deliver our major projects like Western Sydney Airport and the Aerotropolis. It is also imperative that we deliver our social infrastructure, our nurses, allied health workers and educators. Mm -hmm. To re-elevate our teaching profession to one that is attractive and respected. Mm -hmm. I believe we've already started making headway in that area. If you can't even acknowledge there is a problem, then how do you fix it? Mm -hmm. Labor, acknowledge it. We do not underestimate the huge task before us, but I'm confident in the government that our Labor government can, I'm confident in the commitment that our Labor government can deliver. I'm so proud to be elected to represent Penrith, but also to a government that has such a positive agenda, to support our Premier's commitment to a treaty with our Indigenous brothers and sisters, and work with our federal counterparts for the voice to Parliament. It is with great pride that I stand here in a government that is so representative, members with such rich life skills and experience. I have had many a positive comment on so many women members, 50% of whom are in Cabinet. I'm particularly proud of our Deputy Premier, Prue Carr. who I've known for many, many years. I won't mention Kinder. <laughs> I don't think I could be any prouder of her unless my name was Anne or Noel Guillaume. I'm under absolutely no illusion that if it wasn't for the unfailing support and advocacy of Prue Carr, I wouldn't be standing here today. Thank you. Prue, I've said I will always have your back. And I can now say that literally, given my seat allocation in the <laughs> It's always toughest to talk about family. While I, do not, I did not have much of a relationship with my father, especially when my kids were younger, in his later years he did get sober and we were somewhat able to reconnect. I know that he was extremely pr proud of the fact I'd become mayor and he was certain that I would also become the Labor member for Penrith. My father, during his working life, worked for the Sydney Water Board in Bathurst Street, so saving Sydney water was somewhat personal for me. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, my father passed during the 2019 campaign, just eight weeks before election day. I'm sure he and Nan would have front row pews today watching. I cannot find the words eloquent enough to thank my family our extended Irish family in Belfast and England, they have been a cheer squad from afar, thank you. To our wonderful children and their partners, Megan, Gareth, Connor, Brett, Kaiser and Danny, 
who have not a political bone in their bodies, but nonetheless stood on polling booths, election after election, in support. I know you have endured a lot, but have stuck by me anyway. I love you all heaps. To our grandkids, Liam, Judd and Talia, Finn, Tig, Braden and Georgia, you will all light up our life. There is a message in my story, and here I want to speak particularly to women. It does take hard work, perseverance and determination, but if a barefoot, snotty-nosed kid from the back streets of Inner Sydney can win the prize seat of Penrith against all the odds to stand here in the oldest parliament of Australia, then anything is possible. <laughs> Thank you.